presentation. Uh, to begin with, we'd like to show you uh, the film that we produced with Vodafone at the end of last year. Uh, this introduces some of the project use cases and the research we're conducting as part of the project. Five G Rural Dorset is a £7 million R&D project funded by the government. Its main purpose is to find out how next generation mobile connectivity could benefit people who live and work in rural areas such as Dorset. And we'll be building four innovative test beds to test these theories. One will look at the production of food, one will look at industrial applications, one will look at rural business applications, and the last one will look at how we keep people safe along our beautiful but sometimes dangerous Jurassic Coast. So the consortium really started last summer, um, thanks to Dorset Council, um, and we owe them a huge amount for pulling the various consortium partners to deliver what we think is a really interesting project. So we're really excited at how this project can enable farmers in Dorset to see agritech and agritech delivered over 5G as a day-to-day -day reality in their lives. What excites me the most about the future of 5G and agriculture is being able to integrate all different platforms across the agricultural spectrum into one with seamless integration and easy data transfer. It'll be easier to make the day-to-day -day decisions when you've got all that data to hand at your fingertips so all the latest information can be there for you at that specific time instead of having to go field walking and try and figure out where all the problems are the information is getting transferred via 5g that's going to be a big benefit for the future Agritech is really important to prepare students for the future of farming, certainly any technology that we can make the whole industry more efficient and give consumers the confidence that we're actually doing a really good job in the food that we produce and looking after the countryside. So 5G could actually help reduce overheads for companies by allowing them to monitor offshore sites rather than having to deploy vessels and men to go out and visit that site, thereby reducing fuel costs and reducing carbon emissions and reducing labour costs as well. Accelerate will be concentrating on the public safety aspects of this particular project. So the rollout of 5G will enable the emergency responders to be much more proactive, where drones could be used to find people who need help and to even deliver that help remotely if necessary as well. So in the space of 30 years, we've gone from people simply wanting to make telephone calls on a mobile network to people wanting to run their businesses properly. And the idea here with this project is to bring 5G to areas of outstanding natural beauty, but also very, very connectivity challenged areas so that the local population and businesses and the emergency services will also enjoy the same benefits as well. Well, I suppose Lulworth has been involved in rural tourism for over a hundred years employing over 200 people during the summer months, whether full-time or part-time, in my view, has been extremely successful in expanding tourism, which is a very, very important part of Dorset's economy. So what really excites me about the 5G Rural Dorset project is being a UK leader in implementing the next generation of mobile connectivity. From growing the world's first robot-grown field of wheat to using the UK's first implementation of 5G backhaul by satellite. We really are leading the way here in rural Dorset. Good afternoon everyone, uh, my name's Tim Robertson and I'm a project manager with 5G Rural Dorset employed by Dorset Council. I've been given two or three minutes uh, to wear an old hat and use that to illustrate the community consultation undertaken by Dorset Council prior to the successful bid for DCMS Rural Connected Communities funding. During summer 2019, I was employed at the RNLI to positively challenge and provoke the charity to in innovate. The innovation team were very aware that communication between ships at sea remains a problem, limited largely to voice comms, 
with no data facilities and using tech that was firmly rooted in the 1940s. Specifically line of sight VHF radio and difficult to use and expensive to maintain medium frequency or MF radio for longer range. This represents two particular challenges for an organisation like the RNLI in its duty of care for volunteer crew who go to sea and on the ability of the Coast Guard to task lifeboats effectively. Whilst satellite based telecommunications are available, they remain expensive and become less effective in higher latitudes due to high um, angles of incidence. The RNLI had during 2016 and 17 curated a future technology roadmap for search and rescue communications at sea, highlighting the increasing role of both satellite and mobile phone technologies in the future with a blurring of lines between existing carriers. You can see that roadmap on the right hand side of this slide. As I was working to seek emerging technologies to achieve this blended communications vision, the RNLI was invited to attend a workshop hosted by Dorset Council who were interested in understanding the challenges faced by rural communities of Dorset that might be addressed through 5G technologies. I attended that workshop for the RNLI. You can see a photograph of it on the right hand side here and outlined the challenge for a reliable and affordable communications both on and near the water and how beneficial to many communities improved and affordable ubiquitous coastal mobile connectivity might be as part of a blended maritime communications landscape. This connected coast challenge which I laid out at the workshop was taken forward from that consultation session, included with feedback from other workshop sessions and ideas gathered from a drop-in room at County Hall to become part of the successful DCMS Rural Connected Communities bid, one of four testbed proposals based in an understanding of the real communication challenges highlighted by communities across rural Dorset. New technologies such as 5G shouldn't be sold as a solution looking for a problem, but by being led by the needs of our community, 5G Rural Dorset has ensured it's firmly rooted within those communities and answering their real needs. Finally, as an unexpected dividend of this approach, there appears to be um, a wider community understanding, them having had the opportunity to engage with the programme, and the community seems to feel a greater degree that it's doing 5G with the council rather than having 5G done to it. This has been reflected in the unexpected response to 5G Rural Dorset's planning applications, which have so far elicited no objections based on 5G health concerns, despite this being seen as the highest risk to the project during the planning phase. At this point, I'd like to hand over to my colleague Gary, who will give more detail of the wider 5G Rural Dorset programme. Good afternoon everybody. Uh, my name is Gary Little Dyke. I'm one of the project managers working alongside Tim in the on the 5G Rural Dorset project within the Digital Place team at Dorset Council. So before I talk about the 5G Rural Dorset project further, I wanted to just make a few general comments about what 5G is and why we need to do more R&D. There are a few um, features of 5G that mean it's a step change when compared to previous generations, 3G and 4G, for example. There are some things you can do with 5G that you just couldn't do with earlier versions, as illustrated here. Mobile network operators roll out their infrastructure based on a return on investment, um, based on compliance with license obligations included as part of Ofcom Spectrum auctions. These MNOs can get a better bang for their buck, if you like, by investing in more populated areas when it comes to population density based coverage obligations and flatter areas because the signal goes further in a flatter area when it comes to geographical coverage based obligations. Our view is that it's unlikely to be a single use case for 5G in rural areas that warrants the investment required. And so we look at what we call stackable use cases multiple uses for the same 5G technology that are additive. What I mean by that is, while no one use case warrants the investment required, it may be that three or seven or 342 combined use cases would do. So what is the 5G Rural Dorset project? 
It's a groundbreaking £7 million research and development project aimed at understanding how next generation connectivity can help people lead safer and more prosperous lives in rural communities. It's a consortium led by Dorset Council and includes local, national and international partners. And it's part funded to, to the tune of about four and a half million pounds by the Department for Digital, Culture, Media and Sport as part of their 5G Rural Testbed and Trials programme. We often say within the team, if we can do it here, we can do it anywhere. So, for all Dorset. It's one of the UK's most protected landscapes. Connectivity is a real issue. We've got no motorways in Dorset, um, and that makes digital even more important. And of course, COVID-19 has recently highlighted the digital divide challenge with the demands of home working and homeschooling, um, something we've all gotten used to over the last couple of months or year even. Um, it restricts our economy. Productivity in rural Dorset is far lower than the UK average. Poor digital connectivity contributes an estimated £280 million a year to that gap. We've got an older population. Social care spend is more than half of our annual budget at Dorset Council. And we've got pockets of deprivation in coastal areas such as Portland. People from across the world enjoy our beautiful landscape, but it can be dangerous. And tourism is, of course, our biggest industry. Technology and 5G in particular can help address these challenges. It's, I said earlier, it's one of the UK's most protected landscapes and we've got multiple areas of national beauty, uh, triple SIs, conservation areas, we've got it all here. The Jurassic Coast is a UNESCO World Heritage Site and I say again, if we could do it here with the right commitment and passion, we can do it pretty much anywhere. So why are we doing this? To contribute to the understanding of how 5G can be used to address some specific challenges, public safety, economic growth, food production, environmental, we want to develop those stackable use cases that can be used as a blueprint for rural 5G to demonstrate how 5G can be deployed in rural areas cost effectively. We want to support the wider UK 5G market to speed up its ability to serve challenging environment, sorry, environments like rural Dorset. And of course, we want to create new opportunities in Dorset and rural communities across the UK. How are we going to do it? Well, the four research areas that Colin referred to in the video are key. Four different test beds bring in different innovative technical approaches to the way that we deliver con connectivity in a rural environment. Where we can, we're going to use existing infrastructure like masks, fibre backhaul connectivity and buildings to avoid new planning applications. We're going to build fewer new masks as a result, reducing the environmental impact and the investment required that can host multiple providers of equipment. We want to create an understanding of new business models which can make providing life enhancing and life saving in some cases connectivity to rural communities commercially available. So I'm just going to very briefly talk about the four uh, test beds. Well, actually, I'm going to talk about three of them because there's another presentation following mine that will go into a bit more detail on one of them. Uh, it's actually this first one here, the future of food. Our friends at Wessex Internet are going to talk about that uh, in a second. Um, the second work package is the Innovation Accelerator, which is in Winfrith at the Dorset Innovation Park. It's an advanced connectivity that we're going to be providing here at the heart of Dorset Innovation Park, a local enterprise zone and advanced engineering centre, which already supports large and small companies that develop innovative connected products and services. In the Rural Business Accelerator, which is led by our friends at Vodafone and is going to be based around the Lulworth Estate, we'll look to use new mobile services to unlock social and commercial benefits. These will include Vodafone bringing enhanced mobile phone coverage to the area for locals and the one million or so visitors who visit us each year. This work stream will develop the social and economic case for rural 5G deployment by mobile network operators, considering additional use cases, those stackable ones I referred to at the beginning, from tourism management and education to healthcare. Last but by no means least, the connected coast element of the project along selected sections of the Dorset coast, where we will trial applications such as digital signage, sorry, digital signage that engage with the public and improve public coastal safety. 
Accelerate Technology will deploy 5G infrastructure sensitively along the world famous Jurassic Coast, and this will include the first use in the UK of 5G satellite pack. Our consortium partners include Vodafone as the mobile network operator and several other organisations. I'm not going to talk about them all individually. Um, I'm now going to uh, bring my presentation to a conclusion and pass you over to Sally Sommers from Wessex Internet to tell you more about smart farming. Hi, hello. Has my presentation appeared? Yes, yes, you're up. Sorry. Oh, OK, sorry. It looks different on my screen to what I was expecting. Um, so, yes, my name is Sally. I am the head of marketing at Wessex Internet. Also on the call, who you just heard there, is my colleague Digby. Um, Digby is um, um, the project manager for 5G World Dorset project on our side. Um, so it will join us for Q&A at the end for any questions you may have. Um, so sorry i'm a bit lost because when i did this earlier i could see my presentation and now i can't that's um sorry um so wessex internet um why are we involved in in 5g world dorset well um we are an internet service provider that operates across um dorset south somerset parts of hampshire and parts of wiltshire um we predominantly are building fiber networks and taking fi full fiber broadband to countryside communities um we are very passionate about the rural urban digital divide um and 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 dealing with the issues of lack of connectivity in rural areas um we are um we also are um have a farming background we're owned by our founder has a farm in fact the whole business started when he realized we're struggling to get connectivity to his farm um, and in addition we have um with our 2000 kilometers of fiber across um across the uk and um, across the area and our 150 wireless masts um we are well placed to help with the infrastructure elements that gary um, referred to in his presentation so from our perspective we believe that farmers are really um on the sharp end of the the problems with connectivity um recent research from the national farmers union just last week said that 40 percent of farmers um only 40% of farmers believe they have sufficient broadband speeds and less than half believe their mobile signal is sufficient. And one of the issues with that is I think once you can get broadband to the farm, at least that's what we're finding now with our work, but obviously then connecting across all of the property um, can be quite challenging. Equally, we believe that while some farmers feel that the mobile signal is sufficient for their needs right now, their needs are only going to increase as we, as we move forward in all areas of our life, we need better and improved connectivity. Um, and the reason we believe that in the um, farming industry specifically um, is the advent of Agritech, which I don't know if that's something that, that many of you are familiar with, but it's a 218 billion pound global industry, which is producing a whole range of very exciting technology um, for, um, for the use of agriculture to improve yield, efficiency, profitability, et cetera. Um, and there's a few examples here on the slide um, from top left robots, um, which we'll be talking about a bit more, um, drones that offer precision, water in spraying, et cetera, um, a multitude of sensors, sensors to measure pretty much everything that you could possibly think of in agriculture. Um, and down on the bottom left, even sort of when you start looking now at modern day tractors, um, I have to admit, I had no idea how high tech they are now and the huge range of technology um, that is included. Um, so like the, everybody in this project, we've all you know, really focused on the needs of users. Um, it's absolutely fundamental to, to how these trials have been designed. Um, our user group um, we have consulted with include three farms. We have Ranston Farms, a large arable farm in North Dorset, D. Dalton and Son, also a large arable farm in North Dorset, um, and Kingston Moorwood College, the agricultural college that has a mixed farm on site. Um, so Mike um, has 20 years experience running Ranston Farms. Um, he has seen all sorts of different tech, driverless tractors, um, possibly slightly skeptical. And, and the issue he has with a lot of the tech that he's seeing coming into farming is the amount of work it actually produces rather than reduces. So um, as he says here, fiddling with files, manually transferring data, um, and he would like to be able to do that without the problems. Um, 
Sam at D. Dalton and, Sto and Son has been possibly slightly more embracing the tech. He's built his own network around his farm to be able to power and collect data from all the sensors that he's put out. Um, but he is very concerned about the fact that there's all these proprietary systems and a lot of the suppliers seem to own your data, charge you to get your own data back um, and that it, they, they don't all talk to each other. Um, similarly, and David, David's really keen to understand from a um, from a cattle perspective, um, how we can improve cattle health with these new technologies and 5G, um, and how we can also use that data to prove to consumers the sort of um, environmental credentials and that we're doing a good job to look after the countryside. So from our perspective, that meant there was two very clear um, goals that came out of this. One, the need for these trials to show that 5G can deliver real-time data um, that you don't have to go out and collect from remote corners of the farm every day. Um, and that's quite obvious to us. Like that's, that's what 5G does. It, trans it transfers data. Um, but the other thing that we found, and I'm going to try and say this word, I never can, is that it needs to be interoperable that the, the different systems all need to speak to each other and data needs to flow between them. Um, and so that made us come to the conclusion that we can't really do that on our own. Um, and so hence we have taken the, um, the approach of building an ecosystem. We think that's absolutely vital to the success of this trial. Um, and we're working with some leading edge providers. Um, so we have FMET Group, a um, software provider that collects and processes data from right across the farm and combines it into ways that the farmers can access it easily. Um, we have Hummingbird Technologies. Hummingbird Technologies are a drone company. They currently really struggle with connectivity. Um, when the pilots go out to farms to create maps of the farms, really detailed maps um, of them, um, they have to go home and upload those maps because they can't do it remotely. So sometimes they can't supply data back to farmers for 36 hours. Um, Cattleye, we're working with on the dairy side. Um, they're a really interesting company um, that basically are at a animal specific level um, captures a range of data and video um, images um, of the cattle and uploads them again really struggling with connectivity currently because they need quite high bandwidth connections um, in the cattle shed to be able to send that back to the farmer and then we're also working with small robot company that create um, robots that drill water um, in the field um, again, at the moment, they are not connected, and that's something that would have a, a host of advantages. So we're actually working with them to develop the first, well, the world's first 5G agri-robot, um, which is quite um, an exciting part of the project. Um, so what kind of benefits do we want to get from this project? So we would like to see some media efficiency benefits for the farmers in our trials. That would really constitute success. Um, as we've said, it's very much user design. So we, we would like to see the users of these products see immediate um, benefit. Um, we also would like to see this as a launch pad for this 5G agri-tech ecosystem. Um, and finally, we think there's lots of major benefits that could flow from that. So, um, for instance, some of these technologies can reduce chemical use, which could have environmental benefits. Um, better predicting of yields could have supply chain benefits. So we, we hope there's sort of long term future benefits to agriculture that could come out of developing these 5G technologies. Um, so that is it from, from us. I hope that gives you a good overview. Um, I'll hand you back to James. That's great. Thanks, everyone. Um, we've got a bit of time now to take any questions, uh, if anyone's got any. If you'd like to ask us anything about the project, um, please pop your questions in the chat and uh, we'll see if one of the guys uh, can, can answer them for you. Anything from anybody at all? Feel free to unmute yourself and ask verbally rather than typing if it's easier. We've stunned everybody, James. I know. Silent. Yes. Oh, perhaps somebody could give some idea of time frames. Good question. So Gary, what? as you're unmuted. Yeah, thanks, James. Um, 
so we've got about a year end of march next year is the end of the um r d project so that's the point at which we've got funding for so over the next 12 months you'll see the infrastructure will start now to be deployed fairly soon we're in the final stretch of um, finalizing planning permission and actually physically starting to build the sites that are required and deploying the digital signs for example on the connected coast project so um by about um the end of june We'll have done all of the system testing and that should then be up and running and then over the summer months um, through to um, about October time we'll be running those um, use case trials on the system and then the final part of the project sort of from Christmas through to March is wrapping up the outcomes and writing the reports to submit to DCMS. Hopefully that makes sense and, and answers your question, thank you. Thanks Gary. Uh, one from Joe Rufus here. I know I've asked Digby before, but there is a link up with Harper Adams. Oh, it's disappeared off my screen. With Harper Adams and Hands Free Hectare Re Small Robot Company. I'm not sure whether that's a question or a statement. Digby, do you want to pick that up? Yeah, I, I can pick that up absolutely. And so, Joe, I've had a few conversations with Joe on this project. On this project, um, and so yeah, we're working with small robot company um, essentially on on using 5G to to uh, map and weed. Um, an area of arable farmland um, using 5G. The difference, there's a, a very sort of infamous in the agritech world a project called the Hands Free Hectare, um, which is now becoming the Hands Free Farm, which uses uh, small machines, so older tractors that you would have seen ages ago, which is sort of quite small, um, and, and automates their process. So they've spent, they've successfully, um, I think, uh, had a whole crop of uh, a whole crop um, sort of, I don't know, uh, mapped, weed drilled by these uh, machines. And essentially the small robot company is slightly different in the fact that they are looking at robotics rather than automating existing machinery. So there's a slight difference between uh, the two projects, but, but in terms of linking us up, so the agronomist uh, Ransom Farm uses and, and D. Dalton Son uses is the same guy who was involved very closely with the hands-free hectare and hands-free farm. So they're sort of linked up in that way, um, but definitely I think there's more we can do there. Um, and as, as, as Sally, Sally outlined in the presentation, we're very much focused on the ecosystem as well. And so this is definitely something we'd like to do as time goes on. <laughs> Thank you, I just I just wanted to kind of just show that we're not starting from scratch in some ways and that, that we've got some some projects to build upon and so therefore they should enable this to have legs to kind of get running more faster really because of some of the progress that has been made at Harper Adams and I, I know I know that's that's why I've talked to you about it before but I, I just thought it was worth mentioning again so thank you very much yeah great for us thank you Jane Thanks both. Um, I've got a group of, of comments, questions here that feel like they should be uh, for Gary. Um, I'm not a farmer. I live in Coal Hill, a village on the edge of Wimborne. We have fibre broadband all around us, but no access. Similarly, I get 2G access to mobile telephony, provided I stand outside my house or walk along the road. Um, Councillor Ezard also, will this be available to householders? Uh, Andrew Jenkins, will the project for 5G or Dorset allow residential use of the infrastructure? Um, lots of questions like that. Yeah, and so there are lots of questions and and, and, and people may not be uh, completely content with the answer, sadly. It's an R&D project, so what we're doing here hopefully is a step down the road of getting to improve mobile connectivity in rural areas like Dorset. Now, sadly, the decisions, as I said actually during my presentation, the decisions about where infrastructure is built is one that's primarily made by the mobile operators. Um, government intervention is leading to a couple of uh, new initiatives. So there's something called the shared rural network where mobile operators are encouraged to share infrastructure to reduce the cost of deploying uh, their technology. Um, that's going to take time. And ultimately, we are still going to face challenges around the last, the very remotest last 5% of the country where the economic use case and business case just isn't there for the mobile operators. So we are sadly kind of dependent on central government to recognise this um, and continue to invest with intervention in helping the mobile operators to cover the cost of building that infrastructure. Um, the work that we're doing is not really going to benefit individuals longer term. Uh, examples where there might be some benefit, but it'd be very short term, is where Vodafone, for example, are delivering 
5G connectivity. At the same time in Worth Matravers, for example, they're adding 3G and 4G uh, connectivity to their to that new mass that they're building. So uh, certainly on that work package, there will be benefits to local communities, but they're only building two masts. Um, so that's not going to help, uh, sadly, that the, the gentleman that was um, elsewhere. Um, but we're, we're well aware of this and, you know, we will work to try and improve it. It's certainly our ambition to improve connectivity across Dorset. But and I wish I could say something more, uh, more timely, um, that everything was going to be OK in a couple of months. So I'm, I'm sadly I'm not able to do that. Thanks, Gary. Um, just picking up on that, I know we've got Penny, Siddle and Katrina Fountain on the call from Digital Dorset. Um, did you guys want to chip in at all about fibre connectivity or connectivity in general? Or should we move on? Sorry, James, when you say you guys, was that me? Penny, Penny and Katrina, I, I know if, if there are connectivity uh, problems uh, raised, we'll, we'll get back to them offline then, it sounds like. Uh, so, yeah, no, I can OK, I Penny's can coming in. Something. Um, yes, if, if you're looking at fixed line connectivity, uh, we do have a lot of information about that. Um, uh, and if you email us, um, well, either via, via the links that are here on your screen, um, uh, via the 5G programme, they can pass it on to us, or connected Dorset at dorsetcouncil.gov.uk. Um, we can we can answer your specific questions about fixed uh, broadband connectivity. Um, uh, we don't have any further um, information about mobile over and above what the 5G programme has uh, and has already said about mobile connectivity. Um, we're hoping that this project and working more closely with the mobile operators might help us um, to improve mobile connectivity in the future in some way, but we don't have any active programmes around that at the moment, I'm afraid. Thanks, Penny. Um, feel free to pop the super fast email address in the chat while I'm talking if you want. Um... Are you deploying private 5G networks or involving carriers? As said, rural areas are not a top priority. Um, I think we've kind of touched on that. Gary, do you want to pick up there? Yeah, it's a combination. Each work package is slightly different. So um, the Vodafone are leading on what we call work package two, which is the uh, the work package based on the law of the state. So th there that will be uh, 5G technology will be deployed for the purposes of the project. Um, that is commercial coverage. So if somebody has a device which is capable of 5G connectivity, then they would be able to access that using uh, a suitable plan that they may have with Vodafone. Um, the I did say also though that they're they're enhancing their 3G and 4G connectivity in, in the areas where they're building those masts. So that, that will be a benefit. The connected coast work package, for example, um, down along the coast, that's a private 4G network where we're testing the features there of how that would work. That that will only be accessible from individuals who have a SIM card for that network. Um, so that will be tightly controlled. And that's only for the demonstration of these use cases we're talking about. There was another question, James, I'll just refer to about are we building mm -hmm. islands of connectivity or is it going to cover the whole of Dorset? It very much uh, uh, islands of activity to demonstrate a use case. Um, the funding that's been provided is to is to demonstrate the economical use case, as well as uh, how we solve some of the technical challenges around building 5G coverage. Um, and so what we're doing here is providing that back into DCMS. They will be collating that information alongside a range of other projects that they're running with different local authorities and partners. Uh, and they'll be then, you know, over time, that will all help to inform the direction of travel and what we can do in the future. Thanks, Gary. Uh, yeah, one from here from Ben. What split of operator provided 5G versus private network 5G do you expect in the future? Will the shared rural network benefit your activities? So the, the uh, I guess so you want me to answer that, James? Why not? You've unmuted. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, yeah, I, can, I kind of sensed it might come to me. The um, the shared rural network is, isn't is currently a 5G um, project, so that's going to benefit 3G and 4G coverage in some parts of the country. As I said, though, um, you know, from my knowledge of it, and, and, it, and I don't know everything about it just yet, um, it's it's because of those challenges I said earlier about the MNOs get so much money to fix coverage, they will make decisions based on where they can get the best return. And um, 
it may well be that we get some benefit in Dorset, but not as much as we might hope. I think we some of our areas will still very much remain in that last three, four, five percent that needs to be got to. Um, and so we will continue to, to lobby central government to say we need to fix this in Dorset and we need some additional funding and some motivation for the operators to be able to do that. Hopefully that helps. Thanks, Gary. Um, stay unmuted. Uh, can you give us more idea what the business accelerators will do to test 5G? So I'm guessing this is a Work Package 2 related question. Yeah, so um, it's looking at the different things. So uh, Vodafone are coming up with a, a range of use cases. So an example might be um, if you imagine a uh, Lulworth Castle, for example, they've got a party of students, um, young children perhaps from a school visit, who are being told about the history of the area, the Jurassic Coast, and they might go out on a guided tour along parts of the coast. So you might, with 5G, for example, because uh, you know one of the features I mentioned of 5G earlier is low latency, you can use that for things like augmented reality and virtual reality experiences. So those children could be told about the way that the land has formed over time and actually watch it unfold. Uh, overlaid effectively over the real landscape that they're looking at. They may also be told about you know, dinosaurs and they may be able to look at what it would have looked like if there was a dinosaur roaming along uh, the coast, all sorts of things like that. Um, and there are various other use cases. So that the high, um, th higher throughput you get, so, so 5G is faster than 3G and 4G. It's not the only benefit, it's one of them, um, is, is um, allowing you to stream video and higher quality video, might allow you to do some analytics around images. So, you know, you might be able to, to, to use that for various different applications across business. Um, and then the other thing is that with the deployment, we're also having what's called NBIOT. So this is the ability to have multiple sensors. So that might in the future perhaps allow something like, and this is off the top of my head, so um, being able to collect waste bins when they're full or, or, or two thirds full, rather than visiting on a time basis uh, and emptying it when it's only a third full. So that obviously has operational efficiencies and cost reduction potential. So you can sort of roll that out across lots of different things where you might need to visit on a, on a less frequent basis and that would obviously save money. Thanks, Gary. A uh, question here that's kind of agricultural related. Do Dorset Council have a plan for 5G connectivity across the Dorset Council owned farms and infrastructure? I guess at the moment as part of this project, not really, but do does anybody have any insight into what we're doing in the future? I mean, all I would chip in, um, James, is that it, it's the same answer to much of this really, is it? we have to look at this as steps along the journey to justify and why 5G should be rolled out. Um, these stackable use cases, if you imagine a really complicated big Excel spreadsheet that says, if I do this, I'll get £10 contribution towards the cost every month. If I also do option B, this use case here, I'll get another £15 a month. And the tipping point, the cost per user for, app, for the mobile operator might be £50 a month. Once you get to that tipping point, then the operator is incentivized and motivated perhaps to look at deploying that technology to provide that coverage. Dorset Council won't effectively be deploying, well I never say never, but there, is, there are no plans that I'm aware of for Dorset Council to deploy a 5G network. We're helping with this R&D type work to identify what the use cases are to help the operators justify building that infrastructure. Hopefully that makes sense. Fantastic, thanks. Uh, final question here, what is the impact on DC carbon emissions and how does it fit with the recently declared climate emergency? So in, in, in very broad terms, my, my view is that, the, and this is something I, I'm quite passionate about outside of what I do with Dorset Council, um, it, sustainability is very, very important um, and 5G has the potential to make a huge difference. So I mentioned there earlier about the ability to not operational efficiencies and reducing cost. If you're not driving as many miles to collect bins and you're also not um, contributing the emissions that you previously would have done, you know, if we can reduce the miles covered by a third, then the emissions will be significantly reduced. Um, so it, it's a feature, um, these efficiencies and economies that can be achieved will uh, translate into um, 
improvements in in emissions and and those kind of things as well. I would say. I don't, if anybody else wants to chip in, feel free. Tim's got his hand up. I was just um, I was going to put the spotlight on a query from David Barclay about health effects and offer to answer that one. Yep, I was going to come to that in a second, but yeah, Tim, if you've uh, volunteered for that, thank you. <laughs> Um, hi, David. I was just going to um, highlight the fact that all the work that we're doing has been um, assessed using the um, electromagnetic radiation safety guidelines. I think they're referred to as ICNERP, which are the scientifically approved safety levels for um, exposure to uh, radio waves. And all of our networks are entirely safe um, that according to those regulations. Um, I think it's important to raise the fact that nothing that um, 5G is producing is entirely new. We're just um, reallocating radio spectrum which was already used for other devices. So there's there's nothing new or frightening to be done here and there were a lot of concerns expressed about 4G, 3G, 2G radio and um, mobile phone networks when they were introduced. Um, so there's a there's no evidence of harm at the moment. It's very difficult to prove a negative, but if there were any evidence of harm being done, we would be very pleased to hear about it, and that would modify our approach. But currently, there is no evidence of harm from 5G radio. Thanks, Tim. Um, just to add to that as well, the the project is part of a group um, that all 5G testbed and trial projects are part of that constantly monitors uh, this takes its advice from Public Health England and the government and so we we follow very closely what um, they come up with and and as we say you know uh, modify our plan as we go um, if they come up with anything. Um, John says I would expect the inclusion of 5G capability as part of the local plan in the same way that solar is part of the DC strategy for council owned land. Um, that's interesting. Anybody want to pick that one up? Hi, James. I can pick that up. It's Colin. Thanks, Thanks Colin. Hi. Uh, yeah. Thanks for the presentation, by the way. Fantastic job. Um, yes, uh, we are speaking with the local plan team at Dorset Council about um, not just actually uh, 5G and mobile connectivity, but digital connectivity in the round. Um, we feel that uh, the local plan needs to reflect the needs of Dorset communities, obviously, and um, we feel that probably a little bit more weight ought to be given to those um, those sorts of things than is currently in the existing local plan. So it's something that we've taken up directly with the local plan team. And one final one from Councillor Ezard. Um, are the Chinese technology being used? I think you're referring to Huawei. Um, Tim's got his hand up. Yeah, uh, very straight, simple answer to that. Uh, we're funded through the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport, and we were told that we were not allowed to use Huawei within our network. So <laughs> simple answer, no. Yep, no, good. OK, I think that's all the questions we've had for now. Thank you so much for for attending today, everybody. Um, it was good to see so many people here. I'm just going to one last time pop our contact details um, and social media links in the chat. Uh, in case you're not signed up already, we'd really appreciate it if you did sign up. Um, then we can keep you up to date with the project as it progresses. But um, if there are no further questions, that's it from us. And thank you very much, everybody. Thanks. Bye now. Thanks all. Bye.